Hello, Miss Christy. Hi. All right, we're we're ready in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, may I warmly welcome you to the Habibi Center's Talking ASEAN webinar. It is quite unfortunate that this discussion had to be conducted, uh, had to be conducted virtually due to the current COVID-19 restrictions. But nevertheless, I hope everyone is safe and healthy, and I look forward to a productive and fruitful discussion. May I kindly introduce myself first? My name is Taufan Samudra. I will be your moderator for today's Talking ASEAN webinar on the topic of investment in investing in ASEAN, scaling up Taiwan's investment to ASEAN. As you may know, consequent to the election of President Tsai Ing-wen in 2016, the initiative of New South Bond Policy, or NSP, has become a pivot on the increase of Taiwanese investment in the region. As one of the priority areas, ASEAN has been deemed to be the heart of the NSP. The Foreign Direct Investment, or FDI, inflows to ASEAN has increased up to 733 0.3% in the first year after the implementation of the policy, from 3 billion USD in 2015 to 4.2 billion USD in 2016. With Taiwan's vision to diversify its global investment and through the framework of the NSP, it is promising that Taiwanese investments would scale up even further in the region, including in Indonesia. Indonesia is a potential force for Taiwan in scaling up its investment in the region. In 2020, despite the world having been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, Indonesia has recorded an increase in the number of FDI realization from Asian countries, including Taiwan. It is visible in the fact that the number of Taiwan's FDI realization in Indonesia reached up to 454.3 million USD in 2020, a huge increase from 181 million USD in the year before. With that said, how is the contemporary development of Taiwan's investment in ASEAN and Indonesia? What are the opportunities and challenges for Taiwan in scaling up investment in ASEAN and Indonesia? And Finally, how could NSP potentially promote economic collaboration and therefore bolster Taiwan investment in ASEAN and in Indonesia? Therefore, given the various aspects that have to be covered to comprehensively discuss this very interesting and thought-provoking topic, we are highly pleased to have three distinguished speakers to join our session on this beautiful afternoon. But first, as you may know, um, on our uh, slides or, or, or flyers that we published and circulated through our social media platforms of the Habibi Centers, we initially invited uh, Mr. Iqmal Lukman, but due to uh, the uh, prior arrangement and, uh, and engagement, uh, he had to be uh, substituted by uh, Mr. Ricky Kusmayadi, who's uh, here with us, uh, everyone. So the first speaker we have, Ms. Christy Shu who is the director of the Taiwan ASEAN Studies Center, Chunghua Institution for Economic Research in Taiwan. Secondly, we have Mr. Ricky Kusmayadi, who is the director of investment promotion development for the Indonesia Investment Coordinating Board, or BKPM. And finally, we have Mr. Fitra Faisal Hastiadi, who is the executive director of Next Policy in Jakarta. As mentioned, I would like to thank our speakers today to spare their time despite their busy schedules. With that said, I hope we can start the discussion as soon as possible, as I believe a lot of us are impatiently waiting for the dis discussion to commence. But before we begin, I would like to briefly explain the procedure of our discussion today. Our webinar today will be divided into two sessions. Firstly, the presentations from our speakers with 15 until 20 minutes allocated time respectively. So the first speaker will be Miss Christy Shu for 15 until 20 minutes and then followed by Mr. Ricky Kusmayadi and lastly by Mr. Fitra Faisal Hastiadi. After all the presentations are concluded, we will move on to the Q&A session. As you may know, this webinar is also publicly live streamed at our YouTube channel and our viewers can ask questions or give any comments on the YouTube's live chat feature. 
Now that we have covered all the procedural aspects, I would like to invite our first speaker, Miss Christy Xu, to share her views on our topic of discussion today. As previously mentioned, Ms. Christy is currently a director of the Taiwan ASEAN Study Center, Chunghua Institution for Economic Research in Taiwan. She also serves as a non-resident senior research fellow at Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation of Taiwan. Prior to her professional career, she obtained her Juris Doctor from the School of Law, Suchow University in Taiwan, and a Bachelor of Arts in Department of Foreign Literature and Languages of National Taiwan University in Taiwan. I fully believe that her expertise in investment and economic growth aspects would further enrich our discussion today. So without further ado, may I now give the floor to Ms. Christy Xu, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Let me first put my uh, pause, uh, PowerPoint on the screen. Can you see it okay? Uh, now I see the whole screen. Uh, maybe you can uh, put the uh, PowerPoint only. I see uh, on the below on of your screen. Mm -hmm. The PowerPoint uh, over there. Okay. A bit, uh, a bit more down. Let me do it again. Okay. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today and I'm very honored to be the first uh, to be the speaker from Taiwan to uh, share some thoughts on this very important topic. Uh, ASEAN is Taiwan's key investment partner under the new South Spam policy. So um, it is um, it is September 7th, uh, 200, uh, uh, 2020, uh, 2021 today, and it is exactly the 20th month since uh, the corona since the coronavirus uh, outbreaks from China to other parts of the world. It is also the third uh, the third anniversary since uh, uh, since um, uh, President uh, Donald Trump imposed 301 uh, tariffs on imports of Chi imports from China. Um, uh, July in July, uh, July 2018. So uh, in the past years, we have seen a lot of huge changes and challenges. And Taiwan has been very uh, fortunate because we have so far uh, moderately controlled the virus outbreak, if not 100% successful. And uh, we managed to maintain a 3% economic growth rate in 2020 and expect a 5% growth rate in, uh, two, in, in, in 2021 this year. And uh, however, the changes in the past two years have, um, have significant consequences and, and implications. Uh, it has, uh, together with this Corona, uh, this COVID nineteen pandemic and U.S. trade, uh, U.S. China trade conflict, have changed Taiwan's trade structure and our investment activities, and they have created new business opportunities for Taiwan and for Taiwan to work with uh, Southeast Asian counterparts, and also uh, created a lot of new challenges. Just to give you some examples for 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 um, in terms of trade. Since 2018, Taiwan's export to the U.S. market has increased significantly. Uh, in previous year, our share, share of our export to U.S. was less than 10%. But in the past three years, uh, our share to U.S. market increased to around 15%. This has provided new momentum for Taiwan to re-engage USA, the largest and most important uh, market for Taiwan to further strengthen economic partnership. Taiwan's export to another very important market, uh, the EU Commission has also increased significantly. And this includes uh, direct, uh, direct export from Taiwan to EU, as well as uh, triangular trade, 
uh, export from Taiwan to Southeast Asian countries, and then from Southeast Asian countries to uh, to uh, uh, EU. Just to give you one example, Taiwan has been working with EU on uh, R and D for uh, uh, R and D for high quality textile, and Taiwan has here in Taiwan the headquarters has as their operations, their effect, uh, manufacturing operations in uh, Vietnam and in Indonesia to produce uh, the products and from there to export to EU market. So this has uh, also strengthened Taiwan, EU, and also uh, uh, relations with Southeast Asian countries. And uh, uh, besides that, Taiwan's export of semiconductors and other high technology devices and components have also uh, benefited a lot from the trade war due to growing demand in Chinese market and trade diversion to Taiwan. And last but not least, Taiwan's company in Southeast Asia benefited a lot from increasing exports from these host countries to the US and EU. Just to give you some examples, uh, in the past two years, um, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan invested uh, in various places in North, uh, in North Vietnam. They have created a new emerging uh, cluster of ICT and electronic products, and from there they have uh, they have um, export from Vietnam to the U.S. market. And the same thing has also happened in India. Most of our very large ICT company have set foot in India and from there to export to international market. So this is in terms of trade, we have already changed a lot uh, in the past few years. And uh, with regards to, to Taiwan's outward uh, foreign direct investment, uh, they are also undertaking a significant transformation. So uh, in this figure, I want to show you our uh, the uh, um, the structure of our outward investment uh, destination in the past twenty years. So you can see from here this red bar representing uh, the share of our FDI going to China among uh, our total investment in that year. So um, you can see from here, starting from two thousand two. Starting from 2002 all the way to 2015 to 2014 and 15, the share of our investment going to China account for more than uh, 50, 60 percent of our total invest total our investment. And in the year 2010, the share goes to even as high as 85 percent or 80 percent. However, that share has gradually declined in the past years, even before the U.S.-China trade war. So um, since 2016, a share going to China reduced to around 50 percent. And since 2018, the share uh, reduced to uh, 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 less than 40 percent less than 40%. And uh, what is significantly surprising is in the first half of this year, um, our investment going to China reduced to 25%, while our investment in the same period going to Southeast Asian countries, you can see from here, this purple bar um, uh, exceeding 35%. So this is, uh, for many years, this is the first time that our investment going to Southeast Asian countries exceeds the share of our investment going to uh, going to China. So uh, in the past two years, we see a, 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 a very significant transformation of our outward FDI structure. So uh, in, 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 to, to be short, uh, Taiwan investment is getting uh, gradually decentralized from China getting more diverse and getting more nearshoring. And they are sometimes more regionalized. For example, they have right now built in Southeast Asian countries, uh, a different and separate uh, clusters, uh, cluster tailor-made for local markets. National market. And, and you see that, that uh, um, from this year. Hello. There, I think we're uh, losing Miss Christine. Uh,
Um, it's not. It's not getting well. My voice. Okay. Now it's better. Now it's better. So uh, should I repeat what I just said, or you can? It's okay. I just. I think continue. it's okay. It's, it's okay for you to continue. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, besides uh, uh, the very important fact that Southeast Asian country uh, replaced China as the largest FDI destination, uh, the trend will continue. And our FDI going to US, EU, and also other regions also increased significantly. So this is a very important uh, uh, changing dynamics of Taiwan's outward investment. So I also want to share with you some very important survey, which uh, reflects uh, certain challenges for Taiwan's going uh, going to uh, work with Southeast Asian country. Uh, 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 Taiwan's Ministry of Economic Affairs conducts every year a survey to understand the share or, propor or proportion of our production uh, activities uh, in different countries or regions for the total uh, for the for Taiwan's total export orders. And uh, since 2000, uh, 2006, uh, around 15 years ago, more than 40% of Taiwan's uh, production for export orders was actually made overseas instead of Taiwan here. And the share reached its peak in 2015 at 55%. That means more production was actually made outside Taiwan than in Taiwan. However, since uh, 2017, we see uh, production operations were gradually relocated back to Taiwan due to various reasons. For example, the worsening of a, a more expensive of uh, labor costs in China and other other reasons. So uh, the uh, operation operation gradually relocated back to Taiwan. So uh, in the year 2019 share of production for uh, 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 export orders in Taiwan increased to 47.4%, uh, uh, while uh, production share made in China and Hong Kong reduced to 44%, to 44.8%. So this is a very significant return, meaning that uh, manufacturing activities are actually getting back and uh, apart from getting back, they are also getting more diverse into Southeast Asian country. However, I want to share with you that uh, though we have continued to invest in Southeast Asian country, share in Southeast a uh, share of production in Southeast Asian country uh, 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 accounted for only uh, two point nine percent of our of our total production in the year twenty twenty. So. 2.9% percent compared to 44.8% uh, 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 so this means we still need to work a lot to uh, create more production bases uh, in Southeast Asian country. Okay. So um, uh, what is the investment outlook post pandemic? Taiwan will continue to invest in Southeast Asia post pandemic, but uh, in the past uh, few months, uh, because of the worsening situation of pandemic in different countries, especially those in uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, some of our SMEs suffered uh, uh, business loss or even close operations due, uh, due to pandemic. And large, uh, large companies also suffer a lot because they have to shut down uh, the operation in the past two, uh, past several weeks in order to be in compliance with uh, Vietnam's restrictive measures. But uh, post the pandemic, there are important emerging sectors and this include export oriented manufacturing sectors. And this also includes uh, the, uh, 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 the important uh, support industry, which includes intermediate goods, components and spare parts. As far as uh, making a uh, value chain is concerned, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, even Indonesia is considering to, to, to create its own supply chain. 
uh, reducing dependence on imports of China. So this creates a very good opportunity for Taiwan to work, to work with the Southeast Asian countries to together support uh, the development of support industry in these different countries. And also the services, it, the services is uh, getting more and more important. This includes financial services, logistic, health engineer, uh, uh, and also uh, energy. And e-commerce and digital trade is also getting more important for Taiwan uh, companies and also development of real estates and also infrastructure among others. Uh, in the meantime, there are a lot of challenges that Taiwan has to face. Uh, the first one is uh, Taiwan has to waste no time in speeding up automation and smart manufacturing in these different Southeast Asian countries. And this is for the reason to reduce risk of uh, the uh, disruption of supply chain according to the important lessons we learned from the pandemic. And one very important issue is uh, Taiwan needs to work together with Southeast Asian countries to develop human resource de development. This includes development of skilled uh, workers, skilled personnel, and also the development of, uh, development of, uh, uh, of uh, personnel in handling, for example, global uh, supply chain and also in handling the automation. The second challenge with, is with regards to the green uh, transformation, which is very important for Taiwan. Uh, this includes a lot of new opportunities from green and renewable energy, green economy, energy services, and the most important thing that Taiwan company is now thinking to cope with is the decarbonization uh, of their economy and industry. And the third challenge is uh, digital transformation. And Taiwan needs to invest more in, uh, in uh, upgrading its uh, economy and industry to uh, cope with the time of digital, uh, digital, digital uh, transformation. So these are the inve uh, investment outlook post pandemic. Now about Taiwan and Indonesia working together in the post pandemic uh, era. Taiwan has played a vital role in China-centered supply chain and building manufacturing industry in certain uh, ASEAN countries. Now Taiwan is reshaping its role in a new economic landscape. And uh, for example, in the case of Vietnam, Taiwan has been investing in Vietnam for, for two decades and have developed in Vietnam important uh, industrial clusters and supply chain, including in uh, textile and garment, footwear and now in the north part of Vietnam, a new cluster of uh, ICT and electronic, uh, electronic uh, industry. And uh, the fragmentation of global value chain, or you call it reconfiguration or reform or uh, 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 regionalization of global value chain will allow more newcomers to participate in uh, the global and regional supply chain. So right now is the best time for Taiwan to work with Southeast Asian countries in different places for different uh, sectors identified together for uh, the important development of uh, uh, the national development. And uh, one very important factor is if the RCEP is going to enter into force uh, in early 2022, we believe more Taiwan investors will consider Southeast Asia over China as their investment destination to take advantage of the uh, very flexible arrangement of rules of, rules of origin and other uh, preferential treatments, uh, treatments under the RCEP. So uh, given all this uh, uh, background and the development, we believe Taiwan and Indonesia can partner in building key supply chains in Indonesia for both Asia, for both domestic, Asian, and global markets. And Taiwan and India can work together uh, to develop services, agriculture, and process the food, and also to develop, co-develop uh, uh, human resource and also uh, talent uh, cultivation, and also to improve trade and investment facilitation. And uh, 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 Taiwan's investment in Indonesia for uh, the past two decades have focused especially in several 
sectors, uh, the uh, textile and garments, and also uh, automobile part, automobile components, and also elect, uh, and, and also uh, uh, machinery and some electronics. So these are very important sectors, and we believe that uh, Taiwan will continue to work with Indonesia uh, post the pandemic for. Uh, the international market as well as for uh, the economic upgrading for both uh, Indonesia as well as Taiwan's own uh, entrepreneurs. So this, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the very in-depth uh, presentation, uh, Ms. Christie. I, I, I strongly agree with your view on the fact that that the digital transformation in the wake of COVID-19, we experienced a lot of uh, digital transformation in that sense. And uh, again, it's a, it's a great challenge for Taiwan to kind of adjust and, and keep up with the time. Uh, yeah, so again, thank you very much for the very in-depth and comprehensive presentation, Ms. Christie. Uh, in this case, I think it is timely for us to move on to Mr. Uh, Ricky Kusmayadi as the second speaker. As previously mentioned, Mr. Ricky Kusmayadi is the Director of Investment Promotion Development for the Indonesia Investment Coordinating Board, or BKPM. Prior to his current profession, Mr. Ricky has previously served as the Director of Indonesia Investment Promotion Center, or IIPC, in Singapore. He also actively participated in a number of investment and economic related seminars and events with the latest at the investment climate on pharmaceutical and medical devices in Jakarta. I believe that Mr. Riki Kusmayadi's expertise on his, from his wide ranges of designations will deepen our discussion today. With that said, I, uh, may, I now give the, may I now give the floor to you, Mr. Riki, please, the time is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pa Emir, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It is my pleasure to join you here in Talking ASEAN webinar. And then let me start by conveying my warmest regard to the Habibi Center Sims and all the participants. Today, I will share to you about Taiwan's investment in Indonesia, opportunities and challenges, and a short uh, an update about Indonesia's latest uh, investment policies and performances. Next, please. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by discussing about uh, global economic updates. As we know, this pandemic has a global impact that affects uh, worldwide economic growth uh, of many countries experienced a decrease in quarter four 2020 such as Indonesia by minus 2.1%, the United States by uh, two, minus 2.4%, and the European Union by uh, po uh, minus 4.6%. However, in 2021, the economies in many countries has uh, have begun to show a positive trend. This can, can be seen from the economic growth for, for performance in quarter two, in each country that has better than the previous quarter. Indonesia has been able to recover the economic growth by 7.07% year on year in quarter two. Next. During 2020, total investment, foreign direct investment and uh, domestic direct investment reached around 826.33 trillion exceeding the target set at uh, 817.2 trillion or around 100.1%. Uh, Total investment, foreign direct investment and domestic direct investment in 2020 uh, year on year compared in 2019 was increased by 21, 20.5 or uh, 20.1%. In the same period, the percentage of uh, foreign and domestic investment shown almost a comparable trend of 49.9 percent to 50.1 percent. The distribution of investment location in Java is around 49.5 percent, while outside Java is 50.5 uh, percent, which indicate that outside Java is starting to be considered as uh, an attractive investment location. The period of 2021 total investment realization in January until June 20, 2021 reached uh, around 
uh, 42.7 trillion equal around 30.7 billion US dollar and has reached 49.2 percent of the total target in 2021. The percentage of foreign direct investment shown almost a comparable trend of uh, about 51.6 percent compared to 48.4 percent. Since January uh, until June 2021, the achievement of investment realization has managed to absorb the Indonesian work workforce around 623,215 uh, uh, people. Next. Now we are talking about the realization of investment uh, Taiwan investment in Indonesia. As we know, since uh, 2016, the proportion of uh, Asian countries in investment in Indonesia has co continues to increase, including those uh, from Taiwan. In 2020, Taiwan is the country with the highest investment growth in Indonesia with a total investment of 454 million US dollars. During 2016 uh, until June 2021, investment from Taiwan reached uh, around 1.6 billion and was in the 15th position of the total investment realization with a total 3,406 uh, 95 projects and absorption absorption of uh, uh, 97,000 of 201 local workers this amount of investment mainly comes from basic metal metal goods industry non machinery and electric electronic industry, rubber and plastic industry, textile industry, machinery, uh, electronic, medical instrument, electrical tools, uh, precision optics, clocks and watch industry, and leather goods and footwear. The dominant location there is currently the largest investment destination of Taiwan is Java Island, around 65.65%, uh, followed by Sulawesi, 29.2%, and Sumatra, of 4.5 percent and then next please here the top 10 taiwan companies in indonesia next please yeah we hope in the future more taiwanese companies will invest in indonesia next During the pandemic between 2020, 2020 until 2021, Taiwan's investment still show positive performance with a total investment of uh, 612.3 million US dollars. This investment amount comes from basic metal, good, good industry, non-machinery and electronic industry, around 364.2 million US dollars, textile industries about uh, 88.6 million US dollars, medical instrument, instrument pre precision optics and optical instrument, or watches and clock, machinery and elect electronic industry, around 58.9 million US dollar, leather goods and footwear industry, around 55.4 million US dollar, and rubber uh, and plastic industry, around 45.2 million US dollar. Several factors affect that uh, affect Taiwan's investment growth into Indonesia, such as a trade war between U.S. and China, which caused uh, Taiwanese companies to move part of their production base out of China. The implementation of the new southbound policy and the improvement of the investment climate in Indonesia. Next, please. Taiwan is a manufacturer of original equipment manufacturer. Uh, and then ODM products for the world's leading brands such as Intel, HP, Dell, Cisco, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, etc. Some of the major manufacturers, uh, TSMC, Foxconn, Pegasus, Quanta Computer, Compel, and Western are the biggest contributors in the, in the manufacture of high-tech products. In addition, sport apparel and uh, footwear products such as uh, Adidas, Nike, Uniqlo, H&M, etc. also uh, produced by Taiwanese companies such as uh, POU, Chen Group, Nam, Leong Group, uh, Ching Lu, and uh, Makalot. During 2015 and uh, November uh, 2020, cumulatively, China was still the largest investment destination 
country from the Taiwan equivalent to 35%, while Indonesia is uh, only 1.2% and is still below Vietnam's position with 4.4% of the total investment realization of Taiwan. Taiwan investment, which is largely dependent on China, uh, pose a various risk for Taiwan. This can be seen from the trend of Taiwan's investment to China, which has decreased. The trade war between U.S. and China became uh, one of the factors which uh, led up to Taiwan to move some of, uh, of their production base and reorganize, reorganize the global supply chain through diversification and relocation of industry to ASEAN and India. And then, next please. The Ministry of Investment, BKPM, have several steps to facilitate investors to encourage investment. One of, uh, one of uh, which is by conducting focus and integrated promotion through strengthening the represent representative function of Ministry of Investment BKPM in eight main countries. Also integrated promotional activities and an integrated promotion team by region country. Next. Yeah. Uh, in addressing sorry back back please yeah we can see that uh, the diversification of production central to registries accelerate global supply chain recovery gradual, gradually increase the flow of capital and technology building Taiwan position in the global super, uh, supply chain uh, we think that Taiwan is have a great uh, position uh, for us in Indonesia, but we have to encourage more investors uh, that coming to, into Indonesia. Next, please. Yeah, uh, actually we have uh, five step facilitating uh, investors. Uh, first one is promotion in convening investors that Indonesia is an attractive investment destination and then escort in licensing services escort in the financial closing and to end facilitation in relation uh, investment and escort onto the production stage. We call it end to end facilitation. Next. In addressing the, the challenge during the after pandemics, uh, several potential uh, sector need to, uh, to be mapped, such as export-oriented industrial sectors, including the pharmaceutical and medical equipment industry, automotive and electronic industries. In addition, the energy sector, infrastructure, primary sector industries that have added value are also will continue uh, to be encouraged. These sectors are needed to become the backbone of the economy as well as uh, being able to absorb a large workforce which, which in turn can support people's uh, purchasing uh, power. Uh, next. One of the effort to maintain and boost the realization of investment realization is that the Ministry of Investment, BKPM, facilitates the realization of large-scale industrial investment. Currently, the Ministry's investment, BKPM, is targeting the realization of the large investment of, of 517.6 trillion rupiah, about 73.1% uh, of the total pipeline from the total 208 trillion uh, rupiah. The strategy carried out in the context of realizing, the, realizing uh, this investment potential is through the settlement of stalled investment in Indonesia. The, re the solution of this investment problem includes not only large investment, but also the facilitation of small and medium scale investment problem. And also, like, currently the government has formed, next, next please, has formed the Investment Acceleration Task Force, which is chaired by ministries, uh, Minister of Investment, uh, head of BKPM. Deputy Attorney General uh, and the Deputy Chief of uh, Police. Next. Next. Yeah. Currently, Indonesia is the rank of seven, uh, seven third uh, of uh, ease of doing business and expected to be at the top of 20 of uh, ease of the ease of doing business by 2025. The government can continues to 
to strive the improve of Indonesia's ease of doing business uh, ranking by preparing and submitting the 2020 uh, 2022 EODB reform update to the World Bank with several improvement points for the cash indicators uh, assisted uh, in the EODB ranks. Uh, key strategies for improving Indonesia's EODB include the commitment of the government and ministries, uh, structural improvement of regulation, development of roadmaps, implementation that is uh, in the line with the legal basis and this uh, dissemination of the EODB policies. Next. Uh, when we are talking about the tax reform and social uh, security to create a more businesses friendly ecosystem, the government has carried out several major, major reform, including reducing corporate in income tax and improving social security benefits. Prior uh, to 2021, 2020, the corporate income tax uh, uh, rate will around 25%. But currently, the corporate income tax has been reduced to 22%. Next. The fiscal incentive for investment uh, also, uh, we call it some, uh, some uh, deduction of corporate income tax and then tax allowance or incentive for reducing uh, corporate income, income tax. And then the government also prepare of uh, a super deduction tax incentive for investments. Next, please. Yeah, the development of industrial area in a various potential area in Indonesia is not is not only of a, uh, an effort uh, to equalize the economy, but also support the effort made by the Ministry Investment of the KPM. Kept, uh, to capture relocation uh, signal or in order to attract investment that absorb a large workforce and provide added value. The existence of the trade war between the United States and China and the increase in the production costs in China have triggered a number of companies to relocate their factories or out of China in order to avoid the risk applying a higher trade tra tariff and trade restriction between two countries. In 2020, uh, in 2020, the Ministry of Investment, the KPM, has su su successfully identified companies that will re relocate from China to Indonesia. This year, the Ministry of Investment, the KPM, will continue to uh, actively approach and facilitate the realization of the relocation plans of, of the target uh, companies. Yeah, uh, these are also, uh, we call it the economic zone as a strategic investment location. There are some several locations that we call it special academic zone, free trade zone, industrial estates, uh, large scale, and then bonded zone, bonded logistics center, and then also uh, for the other sector, uh, we call it the 10 New Bali. Next. And also, uh, uh, the government have been uh, prepare, uh, preparing for the new uh, Batang in the integrated industrial estate uh, as a reference for in the industrial estate development. The Batang industrial uh, integrated industrial estate was built in response to the demand for the, an integrated industrial area that could serve as an example for other industrial areas in Java and outside Java in terms of infrastructure employment and re, uh, driving national economic growth with a total area around 4,300 4, hectares KIT, uh, we call it KIT Batangs is plan, uh, planned to accommodate three cluster namely the industrial area cluster the innovation district cluster and the recreation, recreation district cluster so far there are four large companies that have joined the first phase of regional development namely KCC, Glass, LG Champ, and then Webin and Albora F3 Field. The advantage of investing in KIT, uh, KIT Batang apart from the strategic location with a high accessibility and connectivity is a more competitive uh, land price with incentive for rent costs uh, for a certain period of time and lower minimum wage compared to other surrounding areas. Kaite Batang is directly connected to the Trans Java Toll Road, and the existing dual uh, dual rail lines is close to international airport and seaport facilities, and is equipped 
uh, uh, with the other supporting facilities in the surrounding area, such as the power plants and water source. Next, please. Ah, uh, um, maybe uh, the I will I will uh, introduce about the job creation law uh, that the new regulation that we have been uh, been done by our government. A total of 79 laws were revised at once and replaced by one job creation law which regulated multi sectors. This law consists of 186 articles and 15 chapters covering 11 clusters, namely the investment and business, act, uh, business activity ecosystem, improvement cluster, businesses licensing cluster, employment cluster, cooperative, uh, and so on. And the issuance of the job creation law is motivated by the target of ease of doing business uh, from rank 73, next please. Uh, in 2020, to position uh, 53 in the in the world, overlapping policies of the central government and the local uh, government, poor corruption perception index, the presence of the phenomenon of uh, hyperregulation, high demand for the job opportunities, and existence of global egos between ministries agency. In terms of benefit, the job creation law is expected to improve the investment climate and create legal certainty align central regional policies, minimize and prevent corrupt uh, practices, simplify regulation, open job opportunities, as well as uh, possible and provide protection and convenience for MS, uh, MSEs and co cooperation cooperatives. Next, please. Uh, the job creation law makes improvement in the term of simplification and acceleration of business license, licensing through a risk-based licensing approach. Licensing only through the online, the online sing, uh, single submission, OS, as we call it, OSS, a single portal, which consists of the information subsystem, licensing subsystems, and supervision subsystem. Simplification of regulation governing uh, investment from 76 law to one law on job creation, standard investment requirement, river to the investment law, confirmation of land use based on the zoning of the RDTR uh, or NRTRW integrated in the OSS system, businesses licensing, industrial estates, uh, special, special economic zones as well as free trade uh, areas and free, free ports can be done within around two hours. Currently, the authorities uh, to issue business licensing covering 16 sectors of businesses licensing in uh, next piece. In 18 ministries, agency has been delegated to the Ministry uh, of Investment BKPM. The issuance of the business licensing is processes through the US OSS system, uh, which is managed by Ministry of Investment BKPM. Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in order to improve uh, investment climate in Indonesia government also made uh, changes on regulation go governing business field which were previously as negatively become investment business field that encouraging the development of priority business field it consists uh, around 266 priority business field and 163 business lines allocated for requirement required for partnership with cooperatives and SMEs and 33 businesses filled open with conditions. I think that's all for my presentation today. Uh, I hope that through uh, this meeting, I can provide an overview of the opportunities and challenges of uh, Taiwanese investment in Indonesia and how to encourage a better investment climate, especially investment from Taiwan. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ricky, for a very in-depth and, again, a very thorough and comprehensive presentation. You talk about both sides, both uh, uh, overviewing the, uh, the the global investment as well as the Indonesia's policies and, and development as well. So, yeah, again, uh, thank you very much. But uh, before we move on with the session, I would like to gently remind the viewers on our YouTube channel uh, that questions could be written in our live chat feature on YouTube, and I will be reading it later on on our Q&A session at the end of the discussion. 
So I think now it is time for us to welcome uh, Mr. Fitra Faisal as the third and final speaker to the floor. As addressed, uh, Mr. Fitra is the executive director of Next Policy in Jakarta. He also serves as, as the lecturer at the Department of Economics at the University of Indonesia. He is also a research director at the Parliamentary Focus as well as the executive director for Indonesian Progressive Institute, Jakarta. He obtained his PhD at the Waseda University, Japan in 2013, and his master's in Keio University, Japan and University of Indonesia, respectively. I believe his expertise in international trade and political economy aspects would further enrich our discussion today. So without further ado, may I give the floor to you now, Mr. Fitra, please. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and then um, very good afternoon to all the distinguished speakers. And also, um, is um, I should uh, say that I'm very honored to be here, yeah, invited uh, by Habibi Center. And okay, so please let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. So um, you're seeing my screen, right? Is it clear enough? Yes, it's clear. It's okay. perfect. Okay. So um, again, very good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I have here for you, uh, uh, of course, uh, we are also um, seeing that uh, the globalization as the main platform not only for investment, but also trade. Uh, speaking of which, trade and investment is actually a nexus. So it is actually uh, uh, dynamically growing under uh, this globalization platform. So uh, to put reverence for uh, today's uh, presentation, I have two or my, of my books. Um, the first one is The Globalization, Productivity and Production Network in ASEAN published by Paul Grave Macmillan. And then previously also um, uh, my other book uh, that is also um, Coping Trade and Investment, uh, uh, which is entitled Trade and Strat Trade Strategy in East Asia from Regionalization to Regionalism. So I put that as my main reference for today's presentation. Um, to make it specific and novel, I also put here, as our team suggests, ASEAN, Indonesia, and also Taiwan. Okay, so uh, let me first move from uh, a brief theoretical perspective. Of course, as I said earlier, trade and investment is a nexus. So you cannot speak trade without investment and you cannot speak investment without trade. So this is actually an interchangeable definition. When I speak trade, uh, it means that I'm speaking also investment, vice versa. The terms of international trade, yeah, of course, uh, 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 along with the investment, has increased. Yeah, that is spurred, that is engined by intermediate goods. So this, along, and this is actually the basic and the fundamental, the build, building blocks of the global production network that uh, previous speakers has uh, has mentioned and then we have also uh, the distribution yeah of the global russian network is actually uh, covering the globe that is why i said to you earlier that globalization is the common platform of trade and investment but of course when we speak about globalization globalization it is not um a neutral word yeah, you can have um, uh, positive comments uh, uh, as well as negative comments because there there is all there is always externalities, especially negative externalities. So the debate is how or whether or not we can reap the gain of the economic globalization through the participation in the production network. So. This being said, that uh, with our team today, how we can actually empower the production network of ASEAN 
and also the surrounding countries, the ASEAN plus countries. We are, we are speaking not only ASEAN, but we are speaking, uh, of course, uh, with the plus countries. We have China, we have Japan, we have South Korea. Uh, of course, we have already uh, signed the RCEP, yeah, plus uh, another country, plus three uh, or four, maybe four countries. Yeah. Uh, we have also um, Australia, New Zealand, India is put on still put on hold, but Taiwan is is not. Not, not not that that uh, way behind because Taiwan is still uh, a part of the big family of RCEP, I think. Um, of course, and then okay. So if we see the trend, um, this trend of uh, the global production network is actually bringing Asian countries to be uh, more convergence. Yeah, uh, that that that, that uh, 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 compared to to uh, years before, yeah. So the trend of the global production network is actually very, very good in a sense. But to the other sense, yeah, to the other perspective. So if you have some kind of shock within the global production network, this same pattern is actually having a very high. Uh, is not uh, is. Yeah, it's not always, but this is 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 actually uh, empirically speaking, uh, uh, this trend is posing a very high risk towards uh, unprecedented shocks. Yeah, here we have, for example, in two thousand eight and two thousand nine, global financial crisis. Now we have the COVID. This is the major disruptions of the global production network. But I tell you uh, some positive side. Yeah, the fortunate effect of the pandemic later on um okay uh, uh, uh this is the, the the last of the, the the theoretical overview of course uh before we move on the fragmentation theory so it is actually very beneficial to countries nowadays to switch yeah from um uh, 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 one large integrated factory one large integrated production network into a, a, a more diversified production so we have the production block we are we have the service links and so on and so forth so we are creating efficiency yeah everywhere yeah uh, in the light of the intermediate goods the intermediate goods itself is actually the one that create this kind of efficiency previously here we have the fourth model Ford model is uh, just a, a very classical way of to, to, to produce things. Uh, it is named as the Ford model because it's, yeah, we, we, we experienced this, uh, this kind of production in the US when they are, product, uh, they are producing their own cars and with their own network and so on and so forth. But eventually this is becoming more and more efficient when they hollow out their factories outside of the border. Now we have Mexico, we have China, and the surrounding areas, especially in Asia, is becoming the major push for the US economic growth because of the service links, because of the production blocks. So this massive spillover effect coming from the Northern countries is, is, is actually uh, evolving Asia even more. Now we have Japan, Korea. First, we have in 1960s the Akamatsu flying geese model. Japan as the leader, uh, and uh, and they uh, and Japan uh, had uh, the second, third, and the fourth tier countries as the like of China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, and most of the ASEAN countries. Nowadays, it's not becoming a classical flying geese model just like the Akamatsu uh, flying geese model suggests earlier. But now it's becoming a more complex geese. It's now uh, the uh, uh, countries that uh, were previously uh, under the second or the third tier countries that well supporting Japan economic growth and production, now uh, they have established their own networks. We have the Chinese production network. We have also here, uh, in, 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 in this case, we have also the Taiwan production network and so on and so forth. So uh, 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 it's becoming more dynamic and complex. ASEAN is actually, is actually not being there yet, but we can have those uh, spillover effect eventually if we can manage this global production network, if we can reap the benefit 
out of it. I tell you how later on. Okay, we can skip this. Okay, this is uh, uh, one of the empirical foundations that is taken uh, for, from my uh, previous research. FTA, yeah, the two uh, two keywords here. FTA first is FTA. Second is the Northeast Asia countries. According to Kawai, so after the great financial crisis in 19. 1998, yeah, the Asian financial crisis in 1998, this is well becoming a major disruption, of course, in uh, uh, East Asia and also Southeast Asia, because this is the locus of the crisis. This was the locus of the crisis in 1998. So after the Asian financial crisis, there, there are um, uh, FTAs and RTAs emerging, yeah, because Asia, at that time has experienced and has learned that in order to cope the future economic crisis, they need to bring this region all together. But that is why we have FTAs uh, that is coming throughout uh, this, uh, the, the Asian countries, especially from the Eastern part. Coming from the Eastern part, China, Japan, and also Korea has, be, uh, has uh, created the so-called spillover effect to ASEAN countries. So um, um, as we might um, know that these three countries, maybe along with Taiwan, it has had their own problems in terms of these uh, political, economic, and international uh, cooperation problem. Uh, the so-called trilateral FTA has been discussed since 2002, but our set here, which was way after uh, the, the discussion of the trilateral FTA, uh, so this is actually the first discussion, if I'm not mistaken, is in 2011, happened and, 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 and becoming a more concrete uh, strategy towards this uh, region. So the trilateral FTA has, has been discussed before, but it's not um, well established. Why? Because, of course, the political and economic factor. So this way, ASEAN, yeah, when it comes to RCEP, we can actually become uh, the common regional platform yeah we, we don't have any issue with china japan okay we, we we are actually an open regionalism an open platform that can actually absorb all of the things they can absorb and they can cope all of the problems that this northeast asian countries they are still encountering uh, until now so uh, in that case taiwan can also experience and can also benefit from the centrality of asean Okay, speaking of Indonesia, yeah, um, here um, my findings actually suggest that Indonesia is well way behind the regional peers. Yeah, because we, if I put also Vietnam here, Vietnam is also way beyond Indonesia. Why? Because we are lacking. We are lagging behind. Why? Because we have the deindustrialization. Yeah, this, this is happening since the early of 2000. We have also the uh, limited capacity, limited productivity, and so on and so forth. So uh, the idea is to actually leverage even more. We need actually the other countries to pull us out of the deep hole. Okay, so uh, uh, so this is actually quite slow progress for Indonesia. But fortunately, the pandemic is creating a positive disruption for Indonesia, yeah, the trade war and also the pandemic. Because nowadays, big countries such as the US, such as the European Union, such as Japan, China, and Korea, they're seeking resiliency, not efficiency, but now they are switching to resiliency. In that case, they need to expand their portfolios, their country and regional portfolios. In that sense, Indonesia is actually uh, doing quite well in terms of having that kind of extra spillover that is happening because of the pandemic. But, but this is only the short run uh, effect. So in order to capitalize it even further, we need to actually push forward some of the things that is becoming a Latin problem for Indonesia. Later, I will uh, show you. 
Okay, um, this is my calculation of the global uh, the global value chain participation by country in all industries. As you can see here, we are actually uh, doing quite well in Indonesia in terms of the forward participation. Of course, we are actually pushing export, but we are quite lagging in terms of this uh, backward participation. Well, uh, um, it, so if I put it into perspective, this is actually very alarming. Why? Because uh, 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 some of the domestic policy in Indonesia is actually constraining the imported or the intermediate goods coming into uh, to Indonesia. We have the TKDN, we have the local content requirement, which is quite quite costly for us. Yeah. So in uh, so that way, we are actually not uh, reaching our full potential. That way, we are actually. Uh, uh, becoming, uh, or say, um, uh, uh, outsider in terms of this global production network. This is Taiwan here, so it's, it's becoming. Uh, so Taiwan is so-so uh, here, also ASEAN. But if you um, have a more granular uh, perspective here, if we actually disaggregate the industries in terms of, for example, computers, electronic, and ele uh, electrical. Uh, equipment Taiwan is here, Indonesia and ASEAN is here. So, uh, in that sense, Taiwan is actually becoming the leader of computer, electronic, and electrical equipment. So, um, in a bilateral relation between ASEAN, Indonesia, also of course we, we are we are talking about ASEAN here, ASEAN with Taiwan, maybe can minimize this gap. Maybe Taiwan here can bring ASEAN here yeah, because of the uh, spill, massive spillover effect and the massive benefits of the cooperation and bilateral cooperation, okay? Now, if we see the, uh, um, what you say, the trend, yeah? Uh, this is the Taiwan ex export, uh, Taiwan export to ASEAN uh, in terms of manufacturing and, and this is the labor intensity, yeah? So in terms of, uh, uh, we are doing quite well, ASEAN, in terms of the labor intensive and resource base is uh, now is becoming uh, uh, decreasing over time. So and 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 uh, to the other way around, we are actually having an extra benefit of high skill and technology intensive production. So in that way, we can say that Taiwan is evolving, yeah, and then we can also absorb that kind of high tech production from Taiwan in ASEAN. Um, uh, Taiwan import for ASEAN. So if you see here, the, the imports is actually, here we, we have this um, uh, massive, um, not massive, but it's actually a very good development in, in terms of medium skill and technology intensive products. We are imported the goods. Yeah. So in that way, yeah, in terms of intermediate goods, Taiwan is slowly becoming our partner in the production network and the productive capacity. Well, our uh, homework is how to switch this to this part, yeah, to high skill or technological intensive because it's steadily dec decreasing. Yeah. So um, um, my hypothesis is, is if we can actually push ASEAN and Taiwan uh, bilateral cooperation even further, we can become the second tier, not. It's, 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 it's not, not a problem uh, for us. The second tier countries for the, the global production are uh, the Taiwan's uh, global production network. So um, uh, as well as we hope that this global participation into the Taiwan's production network can bring us also in uh, to establish our own production network in the future. So that has been experienced by uh, se several countries, uh, just like as I, I told you before, China, South Korea is actually the countries that uh, way uh, they well benefited by the Japanese global production network over the decades. Okay, so uh, um, another perspective. So this is the gravity equation, uh, Poisson pseudo maximum likelihood um, uh, uh, output yeah, from. Uh, 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 trade determinants, yeah, from Taiwan to ASEAN. Here we have the GDP, okay, GDP. Uh, we have also the income, the standard, yeah, and so on and so forth. We have also the distance. We have also the uh, uh, culture, uh, the common language here, the common language. If you speak Mandarin, uh, 
we can actually intensify the trade, yeah, uh, both uh, in ex import and export. And what uh, can I? Uh, what, uh, the, the most interesting part is here: political power, yeah, the geopolitical power. So the new southbound policy is geopolitical factor. Pandemic, to the other extent, is also actually the disruptions that is becoming a, a, a global or geopolitical perspective. And this is actually very powerful, positively affected export and also import. So aside from the traditional gravity equation variables, GDP, yeah, there is actually a measurement of size, population, GDP per capita. And uh, aside from also uh, another variable that is actually well representing uh, distance, yeah, geographical distance, for example, we also have non-geographical distance, non-geographical variables that is actually becoming a major determinant nowadays. Because distance, geographical distance is no longer an issue. We have now the global convergence. Yeah, if uh, Richard Baldwin say, uh, uh, argument about the global convergence the first second and the third unbundling so the distance between the countries is no longer an issue yeah so uh, what is becoming the possible and the probable issue is the non-geographical factors political factors the cultural issue the perspective the geopolitical perspective so if taiwan has has this new south uh, bound policies, this is actually very important in terms of uh, how to connect ASEAN and also uh, with Taiwan. We, we, we have that, that kind of the building blocks for ASEAN and Taiwan bilateral uh, 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 relation in the future. What needs to be done? This is taken from um, uh, my book. So as already posed by the several, uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, just now, we have for the labor cost, it's becoming a major constraint. That is why we, we need the uh, omnibus law. That is, that is why we need the job creation law in terms of to, to match the productive capacity of the labor from the uh, labor side and with the, uh, the, the demand from the investors. We have also, uh, the infrastructure problem and so on and so forth. There is actually uh, the one that is uh, uh, our current government uh, currently doing in terms of making extra investment in infrastructure so that it can actually become the major building blocks for uh, future economic cooperation. Because without infrastructure, we cannot have high productivity. Okay, another uh, perspective, yeah, uh, taken from my other paper. Uh, the FDI determinants yeah, for Indonesia, for uh, especially, uh, and for the emerging markets. In order, in order to have Taiwanese investment, Chinese investment, the U.S. investment, the Japanese investment, the EU investment, we need to have this patent right protection. Without PRP, this is becoming a major obstacle for us. Because yeah, nowadays the global production network meaning that information is quietly, uh, quite uh, uh, I say robustly disseminated. So in that way, you need a patent protection. Without it, investors will actually divert from um, uh, this this uh, selective region. And not to mention, we need also to push the human capital as the. Uh, Chris Manning and uh, Rusat suggest in their paper, or in for for example in Indonesia, our productive capacity is quite stagnant. Our productive capacity, our labor productivity is quite stagnant, even compared to other ASEAN countries. Uh, what makes it even worse is what, uh, what I uh, mentioned earlier: labor cost is steadily increasing. The productivity is constant. The cost of labor is increasing, so you're becoming more and more expensive. Uh, and by the way, Indonesia is now having this kind of limited period of demographic bonus. So we need to actually exploit this demographic bonus. What we have now with this kind of uh, um, development is quite constraining. Another way, yeah, it's not only FDI. 
but we also have the non-equity modes. This is the paper that I have been working on with the uh, ASEAN um, uh, Japan Center uh, in Japan, of course. So uh, we need also to diversify our uh, uh, sources of uh, money coming from outside. It's not only FDI. Yeah, of course, FDI is better, way better than portfolio investment. But we also uh, can have also this non-equity modes of financing, which is surprisingly in the grassroots. When so, this is coming from um, a qualitative assessment from several of the actors um, uh, across industries, and what we learn is they are becoming more and more reluctant to have FDI because this will dilute their uh, what I say what, uh, what I say um, uh, influence in their uh, respect uh, respected uh, industries yeah but NEM non-equity mode of financing is now becoming an arbitrage for this kind of sector so this is becoming a win-win solution a Pareto optimal and another way yeah in order to push uh, our growth even further we need to innovate we need to have the uh, coming again the productivity yeah so productivity is becoming a major buzzword yeah coming from all my research and coming from all the experts okay um to wrap up yeah this is a very classical recommendation of course yeah i must say yeah but yeah although we know uh, all of the uh, recommendation, but it's not there yet. Yeah. So we need the human resource upgrade. Yeah, of course, we need to push this even further, not just as a slogan. We need a logistical infrastructure upgrade. Of course, we are still doing it, but the yeah, uh, some of the infrastructure project is is just uh, not that efficient. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, the the uh bandung uh high speed train projects this is the 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 the, uh, uh, the planning and the infeasibility studies is just bad yeah and then we, we need also to promote trade liberalization of course this is becoming a major buzzword we need to dismantle all kind of protectionism yeah we do if we protect protect and protect no investors will be coming so we need to dismantle we need to have a more broader perspective. We are growing together. We are not growing alone, but we are growing together. And uh, to end this uh, session, we need also to improve the business climate, of course, to increase investment. This is the ecosystem that we are talking about. The ecosystem is coming from the stakeholders. The stakeholders are coming from the four major actors in the quadruple helix ecosystem. This is coming from the government. This is coming also from the university. This is coming also from the community. And also, um, uh, uh, not, to, uh, not, not to mention the, the media and also uh, uh, several actors that can merge this growth, the, the future growth, the future cooperation, without um, the collaboration across actors, the industry, the government, the university, the community, or maybe we can call it the uh, pentahelix uh, with the additional uh, actors of the media, without collaboration. So it is beyond our reach. It is beyond our reach. It's, we cannot reach it. Okay, But this is easier to say than done. I've been uh, uh, discussing with the government um, and I, I know the government, the way they do their job and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's even difficult to manage problem across ministries because the ministries have their own KPI, have their own sectoral ego and so on and so forth. This, this is actually becoming our, our Latin problem. If you cannot, if you cannot handle this problem, this is becoming a major threat for us, Indonesia, yeah, and because Indonesia is uh, ASEAN, yeah, it, you cannot actually exclude Indonesia from ASEAN. Without Indonesia, ASEAN is not ASEAN because our uh, 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 Indonesia is now is becoming uh, a dominant player in, in, uh, and de facto leader of ASEAN, but. Uh, the, the problem that we are posing nowadays is, is becoming and slowly becoming the ASEAN's problem. So we need to tackle our own problem. 
so uh, to tackle the ASEAN's problem. Yeah. Our aim is to actually uh, expand and actually to reach the uh, minimum target of uh, uh, escaping from the middle income trap. As my uh, book suggests, we can do so if we can push industries, if we can push collaboration. Without it, maybe we, 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 will, we will become old without being rich. Thank you. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Fitra Faisal, for the very, again, very thorough and um, um, uh, complete presentation. I, I must say, you, you discuss a lot about the uh, uh, statistical data as well. And, and, and again, it, it further enrich the uh, presentation. Now, I think we are already at the uh, uh, final uh, um, session of our discussion, which is the Q&A session. We have a few questions already from our participants. So I will read them out to the speaker. So probably it is easier for us to go through the first question first and then uh, and, and, and then uh, with the responses and answers from the speakers and then followed by the second and then so on and so forth questions. Uh, the first question, um, uh, sorry. The first question, this is from Hanif uh, at the University of Indonesia to all of the speakers. Uh, the question is, as Taiwan's views and policy has shifted to a more sustainable to create less carbon footprint, is this also a priority concern for Taiwan on their FDI upon ASEAN, especially Indonesia, and other similar agrarian nations. I think I think this question is for Miss Christy Shu. Uh, please, uh, Miss Christy, the time is yours. Um, yes, thank you very much for this very important and actually um, timely timely question. Um, Taiwan has set up uh, some goals for uh, to respond to climate change and also, as you mentioned, the green economy. And this has been put uh, in places of, uh, of several of our uh, industrial strategies as well as action plan. So as far as um, 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 uh, business sectors is concerned, they are not only uh, trying to green their industry, their uh, industrial outputs and investment here. They are also working very hard to green their investment in uh, in, 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 in overseas country. Uh, just for, just give you one example. Uh, I mentioned uh, Vietnam as a case again, because uh, recently uh, uh, Taiwan has been a lot of uh, new investment going to, uh, going to Vietnam both um, labor intensive industries as well as a new uh, emerging uh, more uh, more high technology industry for example the uh, production of smartphone and also the apple supply chain they are now uh, both out of their own company's uh, strategy as well as being requested by their international clients by uh, internet, by uh, referring to international clients meaning uh, uh, clients from US or Clients from the EU uh, who uh, demand more, uh, who demand more compliance of all this uh, decarbonization, and also other 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 standards. So they are now uh, companies in, in in Vietnam actually working very hard to uh, upgrade and also to conduct, as I mentioned, the green uh, transformations. So that has been one uh, very important case. And given uh, given the current uh, pandemic. They waste no time in doing this, and I believe that uh, these are the these are uh, uh, being demanded by international clients. But for smaller companies, uh, the SME, they are they don't they don't receive such pressure. So uh, the government from both Taiwan and the host uh, host economy need to provide assistance for the smaller companies from Taiwan investing in your country to um, to upgrade and also to uh, to adopt uh, different uh, different standards and different measures to green uh, to green their uh, manufacturing uh, operations there 
Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Christie. Maybe any other comments or responses from uh, Mr. Fitra or Mr. Ricky? If not, we can continue to the second uh, question. This is from Agustiono at the University of Chiputra in Surabaya. I think this question is for the three of the speakers. So the, the question is, the ties between Indonesia and Taipei are not limited to the economic sp sphere. Cultural, cultural education interactions have also grown in recent years and have become the supporting pillars that have allowed economic relations to flourish. What are the opportunities related to Indonesia and Taiwan cooperation in education sector in the coming years? Uh, probably we could start with uh, Mr. Fitra first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. So as I mentioned earlier, the non-geographical perspective, the non-geographical variables plays uh, important role nowadays. It's not the, just GDP, it's not just the distance, but we are now seeing cultural proximity. We, we are seeing common language and so on and so forth. If we can speak and we can understand each other, this the trade and investment can intensify. <clears throat> if we understand each other cultural, uh, cultural, culturally speaking, we can actually, can uh, have a, a, a tighter bond yeah, in the future. So in that case, education plays an important role, in not only um, um, uh, horizontally, but also vertically. In sorry, sorry, not only vertically, but uh, but also horizontally. In, 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 when I mention vertical, means that you can upgrade your skill set in order to comply with the needs of the industries. When I say horizontal skill, meaning that you can actually understand each other. You can understand the ecosystem. You have the same bond. You have the cultural bond that is actually tied by education. So I think uh, we need to have this kind of, um, uh, what is it, cooperation in the future. Taiwan, ASEAN, Taiwan, Indonesia, Taiwan can, uh, 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 can, can can bring the students here in Indonesia and ASEAN. We can also send our students there and so on and so forth in this education co uh, cooperation. This, this is this is actually doable. And this intangible, intangible cooperation, this intangible, what do you say, um, uh, you say way to, of production is actually becoming more and more beneficial. So that's my take. Thank you very much, Pak Fitra. Uh, probably we can move on to Pak Riki. Any comments or responses on this question? Yes, Please. when you are talking about the, if I'm not wrong about the education, right? Yeah, when we are talking about the education, we are very open to to, uh, to encourage yeah, all of the uh, foreign direct investment, especially from the e education also, uh, to invest in Indonesia. So uh, not not only the formal education, also like uh, vocational education, such as uh, uh, especially for the uh, uh, yeah the technically uh, technically for uh, supporting the manufacturing it itself, and uh, of course also uh, we encourage the, the for all foreign direct investment, especially for Taiwan to to get like uh, uh, invest in research and development in Indonesia. As as uh, you know, uh, pa Faisal already mentioned about all the things that we have uh, the, uh, 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 quite challenging in the in this se sector. Uh, so uh, with the R and D research and development, uh, with which which means that uh, we will increase our our yeah uh, our of course the investment climate and then also the the. Uh, the 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 knowledge of the our our people in Indonesia. I think I think that's uh, we are very open for that one, uh, for encourage all of the the investment from the Taiwan related to the education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pak Riki. Uh, can we move on now to Miss Christie, please? Yes, yes. Um, I think um, some pre uh, speaker mentioned about the new South Bank policy. Uh, New South Wales policy actually has more uh, than economic goals. Uh, for example, uh, not only to promote trade investment, 
but also to promote the most important uh, uh, people to people exchange. And uh, in the past year before, before the pandemic uh, 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 forced us to shut down our borders, actually Taiwan has been receiving increasing number of tourists, uh, tourists and also students uh, coming from uh, different uh, Southeast Asian countries. For example, uh, we, we used to have more tourists from Singapore and Malaysia and more students from these two countries because they have because they have a lot of Chinese. But in the past several years, we have more, we have increasing number of tourists coming from uh, Thailand, coming from the Philippines, uh, and also more students coming from Vietnam, for example. Right now, you can imagine, we have a lot more Vietnamese students studying Taiwan in different sectors. So uh, I think that is uh, that, that provides a very important important uh, uh, ties, a uh, base of ties for Taiwan to understand uh, Southeast Asian countries. Unfortunately, uh, both tourists and also students coming from Indonesia has not been very phenomenal. So I think that is something we can promote, not only for Indonesian people to get to know Taiwan, but also for Taiwan, uh, for Taiwan people, Taiwan society to get to know more about Indonesia. You know, why uh, our companies chose uh, chose Vietnam or chose uh, Malaysia over uh, over uh, uh, over uh, Indonesia, for example, because uh, it's easier for them to adapt themselves culturally, uh, culturally in Vietnam and also in Malaysia, because Vietnam also is not a, a Chinese-based society. They have very similar culture uh, uh, with, with Taiwan, but Indonesia is. To be honest, very difficult for some uh, for, for 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 some of our uh, companies, and not to mention about very different type of mindset, uh, different type of uh, mindset, and also different kind of legal uh, system and others. So I think that is something we also have to promote to get to know more about each other. When Taiwanese company get to know more about you and get to know more about your people, I believe they will find because Indonesia is always in their mind it's the largest economy, the largest economy and market market in uh, Southeast Asia. So I believe they will be more encouraged to go to explore uh, opportunities in Indonesia. All right, thank you very much speakers for the uh, answers. Uh, this is a third question. We have a lot of questions now. The third question is this for from Askar uh, at the University of Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia and Taiwan do not have FTAs. At the same time, Indonesia, along with other ASEAN members, joined the R RCEP. Is Taiwan's absence from the RCEP could allow trade diversion, diversion to occur? Does Taiwan consider this a problem? If yes, how to overcome this problem? A very interesting question from Askar. Uh, please, uh, maybe Ms. Christie to, to, to begin the, the answers, please. Yes. Um... Uh, among among ten uh, ASEAN countries so far, Taiwan has only signed one FTA with Singapore, and it was done uh, previously. I think back back uh, back back in 2000, uh, 2013. And I think most of you do not know that actually uh, several years ago, uh, my institution together with a think tank in Indonesia have concluded have concluded a joint FTA study between Taiwan and Indonesia. But ho however, um, not much uh, progress since uh, the conclusion of the study. So if uh, Indonesia finds it unnecessary and useful, I think Taiwan on Taiwan's side, we will be more than happy to uh, revisit the uh, a previous study to explore new opportunities uh, post pandemic and especially given the, ch the huge changes in the past years uh, due to uh, US-China trade war and transformation of global, uh, global value chain. And uh, uh, having said that, Taiwan has also uh, not been uh, able to join the RCEP, uh, RCEP for now. And that has two different impacts uh, for uh, Taiwan companies already, already investing in uh, Southeast Asia, including in, in, in Indonesia. They benefit. Uh, they, they will benefit from the implementation and enforcement of the RCEP because uh, they will be able to uh, import, for example, goods from Thailand, goods from China at a lower cost. Uh, but but for company that still are here in Taiwan and have not uh, have not invested in uh, any of your countries, I believe that will 
uh, attract more Taiwanese companies to to invest in Southeast Asia, to invest in Southeast Asia to take advantage of the RSA. So for Taiwan, yes, we will be um, uh, we will be impacted by the formation of the RSA because we are not one of them. But I think for business sectors, they have their ways to respond to that kind of change. But uh, having said that, small uh, SMEs again will be the more vulnerable group that a uh, vulnerable group for that. So I think. I think uh, Indonesia and Taiwan can explore ways to help uh, uh, SMEs in Indonesia to uh, cope with the new changes and also to uh, find more opportunities for uh, SMEs in Taiwan to work with Indonesia in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Christie. Uh, may I now invite uh, Mr. Ricky to kind of uh, give a, a response to the questions, please? Yeah, of course, when we are talking about the agreement with the two, two countries, uh, or whatever it is, or FTA or CEP, and uh, it is uh, very important for two countries, of course. But uh, if, if, uh, as we can see from my, uh, my presentation uh, just now, uh, the investment from Taiwan still increasing without this kind of uh, free trade agreement or, or, or anything. Yeah, I believe that uh, in the near future, investment from Taiwan still uh, still increasing, and of course, uh, um, maybe in the, uh, in, the uh, in the near future, uh, we'll be have some kind of the new agreement, something uh, that that can be pushed together to increase our cooperation with uh, Taiwan. I think that uh, should be better for us. Now, why? Because Taiwan is still one of our priority uh, investment uh, target for uh, for FDI in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Riki. Uh, maybe we, we can continue to uh, Pak Fitra to answer and give any responses, please. Yes. So uh, one of the major attributes that is actually uh, becoming the ultimate goal of RTAs and FTAs uh, is actually uh, trade creation. But uh, we need to understand that into every regional cooperation, regional trade agreement, yeah, uh, we can actually create the, tri uh, the, the trade diversion effect as well. So we have the trade creation and trade diversion. So now, uh, we, we are seeing that our SEP is, uh, okay, we already signed our SEP, it's not into force yet. Uh, speaking of, of which, so um, maybe in order to actually intensify ASEAN and Taiwan, we need also to have this kind of the bilateral cooperation. If not, although it's, we are not seeing it now, although the trend is quite increasing, but the trade diversion and investment diversion effect is existing empirically. So yeah, we need to be aware of this prospect. And uh, maybe we need to handle some things or two things, yeah, in order to cope with this RCEP and also the trade and investment diversion impact as well. So yeah, this is actually the one that that that, that might uh, we might face in the future. Thank you very much, Pafitra, and all the speakers. Uh, move on, moving on to the fourth question this is from sarah at the university of indonesia according to indonesia so i guess this question is for mr uh, ricky to answer according to indonesia do you see the belt and road initiative a win-win strategy uh if indonesia supports taiwan will they lose fdis from china a very interesting one too uh please but ricky yeah uh, because of our currently uh, uh uh, one china policy yeah. we still uh, we still use this uh, policy uh, of course uh, but for the taiwan we we we, we have uh, good uh, opportunities and then cooperation with the economic one so uh, we are still on this uh, one china policy and then also maybe you know, for the near future like i mentioned before there there will be the new uh, uh, the new opportunities to get a more attractive uh, uh, agreement between Indonesia and Taiwan. Yeah, but like I mentioned before, of course, uh, uh, China is uh, still the greatest one uh, today if we compare with other countries uh, when, when we're talking about the investment. But opportunities that coming from Taiwan is still uh, still there. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, if, as we can see right now, uh, yeah, me, myself, I, I, can, I can face that. Uh, 
like uh, uh, today I will still facilitation of, uh, of facilitate the investment coming from Taiwan, like in Cherbon and then in Sangarang, and they, they are still ongoing uh, invest Indonesia. Yeah, uh, we can see that the fact that uh, we are not in the uh, some uh, agreement, but uh, the 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 investment that coming from the Taiwan still on the uh, yeah op optimistic way. I think I think that's that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Ricky, for your uh, answer. Uh, maybe there are any responses or comments for this question from Pak Fitra or Miss Christie. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. If Please. I may, sorry. Please. If I may add some comments. Um, yes, I think I think um, um, Taiwan continue to uh, invest in different uh, different um, ASEAN countries, and I think Indonesia should be uh, should be happy with, uh, uh, with with our investment last year, uh, in significant increase. However, so far. Uh, among these 10 countries, our investment, I, I think more than 40% of our investment actually goes to uh, goes to Vietnam. Uh, because Vietnam actually has more flexible policy. I mean, they 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 uh, more flexible uh, more flexible policy to attract Taiwan investment. For example, Vietnam uh, signed with Taiwan an upgraded uh, bilateral investment agreement uh, two years ago. Two years ago, and it helps. Uh, it helps to address the uh, investment protection issues and also investment facilitation and promotion. So I, I would like to uh, uh, encourage Indonesia to consider more flexible ways to uh, uh, cooperate with Taiwan, so that Taiwan can choose to invest more in Indonesia. Because um, you're much larger, you're much large, uh, you're much larger economy and much uh, much larger uh, market. And uh, one other reason for Taiwan to focus in Vietnam is because Vietnam has signed a lot of FTAs. So Taiwanese company is very happy to take advantage of their FTA networks to uh, to export from Vietnam to uh, EU, for example, to uh, uh, to other countries. So I believe. Um, uh, the more you liberalize yourself, including trade structure and also investment scheme, the more you will you, you will promote uh, uh, investment from Taiwan. I think that would be some uh, area that we can uh, we can we can have more discussion so that uh, Taiwan uh, investment can be further encouraged to move to uh, Indonesia instead of uh, no, focusing in one or two uh, specific countries. Thank you. Can yes. I have some right. comments? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, uh, for your comments, Boo. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, with with, with kind of this, uh, uh, we can say that challenging, yeah, within with with, with uh, challenge uh, challenging with the, between Indonesia and Taiwan. Uh, so uh, the one of our uh, solution is we 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 uh, we, we provide the, like the. Uh, in uh, industrial estate in uh, Batang, you know, uh, industrial in, industrial estate in Batang that uh, provided by our government. So it is very, uh, very flexible. Very uh, flexibility is there. I'm, I mean, like like such as uh, such as so for the even we can give you the free of uh, charge of uh, uh, rent of land, something like that, uh, uh, between three until five years. And then also a lot of a lot of uh, incentive, uh, ta uh, uh, tax incentive, and then the the, uh, the facilitation incentive for investment, especially from Taiwan. Also, we we, we are very very uh, very uh, ready uh, to uh, yeah to 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 provide our our new kind of uh, industrial estate in Batang. That uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, like uh, this this one is provided by our government. It's very fast, uh, fast track uh, uh, industrial estate. Especially if you have uh, any opportunities, your 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 I don't know your your clients or your uh, your colleague that want to invest in Batang area, just just call us because this is very very easy for investment that we can offer to 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 you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pariki, and thank you, Ms. Christie, for the responses and answers. And uh, this is the fifth question. This is from Morgan. This question is for, for Ms. Christie. 
for Taiwan in the post pandemic era, how does the new southbound policy assist economic recovery of Southeast Asian countries? Please, uh, Ms. Christina, the floor is yours. Yes, this is a very, um, this is a challenge actually being uh, pondered here by our uh, business leaders as well as our policymakers. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the pandemic forced us to uh, close our borders. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, exchanges uh, 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 between Taiwan and all these different uh, Southeast Asian countries. But uh, that kind of exchanges have been slow have, have slowed down uh, in the past in the past months. And uh, uh, but but a, a lot of business a lot of business uh, activities are still going on. So I believe a Taiwanese company would uh, be more than happy to 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 explore any uh, uh, opportunities to um, help or to work with these countries for uh, economic recovery. One, uh, one sector I know uh, for sure is that all these countries are talking about green transformation and digital transformation. And uh, a lot of companies already investing in, your, in, in, in these countries are speeding up their transformation in their factory. For example, I know some companies are already uh, when they build when they when they build their new factories they already adopt the uh, 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 the green uh, the green uh, green uh, building green building to uh, to 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 meet the international standard so that is one way to contribute to uh, this country's um, uh, 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 economic policy post pandemic but i believe there are some other ways so uh, what is good for the pandemic is everything can be done digitally so i believe there are ways that we can still communicate with each other to think of things that we can work together through uh, uh, through uh, digital digital communication or webinars like this thank you very much any comments or responses from uh Mr. Fitra or Pak Riki? If not, we can move on to, this is the final question also to, to also close the discussion. This is from Lutfi at the Habibi Center. Uh, this question is for, for all speakers. Uh, do you see the, this also uh, uh, related to the, the previous question. Do you see the One China policy as a challenge in the effort of fostering Taiwan's investment and more broadly economic cooperation in ASEAN and Indonesia. Uh, maybe we can start uh, from uh, Pak Fitra, probably. Please, Pak pa Fitra. I think no issue. This is actually when we when we actually discuss about the economic cooperation. So it's economic cooperation. So we, we don't have any issue on. Uh, what, uh, whatsoever one uh, one China policy that is actually um, uh, political attributes that that is big divine ASEAN and China relation. But in the other perspective, Taiwan is too important. Yeah, as just like I uh, showed you earlier, that we can have this massive spillover effect, especially from the uh, computers, electronics, and machineries. Yeah, that can actually also bring ASEAN into the next level of. Uh, growth and development. So I think no issue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, Pak Riki, uh, any answers or comments, please? Golden agree more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is there is no issue about this one. Oh, there's no issue. Like I mentioned before, of course, uh, we, are still, we are still optimistic to, uh, yeah, especially for, for the investment coming from Vietnam, or we'll still growing for the next uh, future thank you all right thank you very much maybe from the taiwan side please uh miss christy well uh uh i i ideally it should be no issue because economy is economy and politics is politics but however there are always things that are uh that uh, there are always things that may uh they may uh uh, uh, uh complicate it they may complicate uh issues for example, uh, we do, I mean, so far we uh, side, we try to sign trade agreements with uh, uh, ASEAN countries and have not been uh, very successful because we have concluded only one. But we do have a lot of MOUs and also agreement and arrangement and action plans 
with all of with all of the ASEAN countries, for example, to facilitate uh, exchanges of uh, of human resources to uh, facilitate uh, a, a technology uh, cooperation, etc. So I believe, uh, given uh, one China policy. Uh, there are still a lot of room for Taiwan to work together with you. And I have to mention that, uh, I, I mentioned that um, um, in the three years, in the past three years, the whole world has changed, not only for this part of this part, but also for other parts of the, uh, 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 in the world. So I believe that uh, uh, it's time for a lot of countries to redefine and redefine and review the, uh, uh, not to change the one part uh, one china policy but to redefine and review the explanation and definition of the one china policy to allow more room and more room and autonomy for if these countries want to further economically engage with taiwan and uh uh to to believe me that um taiwan is now very popular because we are trusted uh, as mentioned by uh by by a speaker we are trusted. Uh, 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 we are trusted partner in terms of um, investment and manufacturing activity and trade. So uh, we believe we have the ability and we can play a very important role. So depending on uh, which of these countries can embrace embrace your hands to embrace to 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 embrace more about Taiwan, given uh, more flexible flexibility in terms of uh, policy, uh, your policy, your your your, your uh, uh, politics, and also your uh, relations with China. Uh, I want to add. Uh, uh, yes, please. Argument. Um, first, yeah, um, based on my experience on um, years of research, uh, that market driven activities can actually push institution driven uh, uh, and institutional arrangements. So we ha we already have this fundamental, uh, we have already have this building blocks, as I mentioned before, this will slowly evolving, maybe not slowly, maybe we will be rapidly evolving, uh, it depends on the situation, yeah, uh, to, to make a more institutionalized approach. I must say that if Chinese Taipei or Taiwan can play for the Olympics, so why not we can have this uh, cooperation. So Chinese Taipei and China is actually they they have the Olympics, eh? Chinese and also uh, Chinese Taipei. And then uh, 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 although we, we we know eventually that the Chinese is actually also claiming the medals from the Taiwan, but yes, everyone can play. I think. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you so much. A very interesting answers from all the speakers. Uh, I believe uh, we are. We've already come to the end of uh, today's discussion. We already have. Uh, we already go through a very uh, a, a fruitful discussion. I believe. I would like to thank our three speakers, Ms. Christy Xu, Mr. Ricky Kusmayadi, as well as Mr. Fitra Faisal, for your insights on this issue and for all your comments and responses. It has been an immense honor for me to and and the Habibi Centers to have you as our speakers today. I would also like to thank our, our participants for taking part into today's discussion and have been very active asking a bunch of very great questions for our discussions today. And may I also apologize that uh, some of the questions cannot be uh, put out uh, to the discussion due to the time constraint, but I believe the, the discussion already fruitful and, and productive. I hope all of you have enjoyed our webinar and stay safe, stay healthy, and I look forward to seeing you in the Hobby Center's other future events. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. See you again. Thank you, Ms. Christie, Pak Ricky, and Pak Have a good day.